you should all be looking at Grand Central at night. And Grand Central is one of my favorite programs and I've got a lot of slides to cover it. Apparently I'm not allowed to give you a test. I am so disappointed. I actually have a number of railroad videos on my YouTube channel, which is called Be More Better. And uh, you were told that questions get sent by chat. If any of you is distant, you know, a million miles away, send a chat that says where you are, because uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, I, I, the question I would normally ask if you were in front of me is whether or not you have all been to Grand Central and whether or not you have seen the invisible statue which stands exactly on the corner of 42nd Street and Park Avenue. And that's the corner, 42nd and Park. And this is not the statue, this is me. The statue, interestingly enough, is invisible. And I know that personally because I have walked by the front entrance of Grand Central 10,000 times in my life. And I never ever saw the statue and it has to be invisible. Um, I, I have my own unique uh, unusual thing in that it is I have a plan and it is a very good plan. I'm going to be 29 years old on my next birthday. Now here, is an invisible statue. And when I say invisible, it's not like a tiny statue. He is eight and a half feet tall, made of bronze. And he's standing on a nine foot tall pedestal. So how did you miss a, a 16 and a half foot thing? that stands exactly on the corner of 42nd Street and Park Avenue. But I never saw it the, despite having been there 10,000 times. And by the way, I never counted the number of times. So maybe I was only there 9,992 times. Um, the man whose statue is there is someone you should know. Uh, he's the great regs to riches story. However, he died 40 years before Grand Central was built. So it's an interesting question of why I think you need to know about him. Uh, he had no education, virtually no education. Uh, he went to work for his father when he was age 11. Uh, his father used to take vegetables back and forth between Staten Island and Manhattan on a little boat. And this man, uh, became married, was married when he was 19 years old. Uh, he married his first cousin. He wound up having 13 uh, children with her. So they were busy. And one of the interesting things about him is that his competitors thought that he was an unmannered brute from Staten Island, because I said he had no education. And uh, but a lot of people thought that he was more a builder than a wrecker, uh, that he was uh, shrewd and he was honorable besides being incredibly hardworking. When I say incredibly hardworking, that started early. He was called Commodore and he wound up owning his own boat from Staten Island to Manhattan when he was 16 years old, he borrowed money from his mother because they were very frugal. And the name that you see, Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt, <laughs> since he's from Staten Island, we are talking old Dutch. He, originally, he was Van Der Bilt. And he wound up building one of the great maritime empires in the world. Um, uh, some odd things is that uh, he wound up getting a Congressional Gold Medal uh, by the U.S. Congress. Um, a, a unique man. He actually, despite the fact that he had no education, wound up writing his own lawsuit that wound up in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. So he must have been a really interesting man. And I never missed, I didn't know him. 
Um, he became the richest man in America, maybe. Maybe he was number two. It's really very hard to say how rich these rich people were. Um, what you're looking at here is something called the Breakers. The Breakers is the family summer cottage. It's in Newport, Rhode Island. It's a national treasure. It has 70 rooms. Uh, it was built by his son. And that is after the fortune was sort of broken up and distributed to the various sons. The Breakers was built by his son as a summer home. It has, and I don't really understand this, but it has 62,482 square feet of living space. And what's weird to me is that the house is measured at 125,339 square feet of space. So I don't know where the extra 62,000 more or less feet is, but you can identify a few things that take up space. The, the great room in the house, the great room is 50 by 50 with a 50 foot tall ceiling. The dining room alone is 2,400 square feet of dining room. The house is fireproof. They didn't want to have a problem. So it is built of structural steel and to make sure that like if the boiler broke down or the boiler exploded, it would not cause the house to go on fire. The boiler is built under the front yard for safety and the heat is then sent into the house. It, it, it's a world that we don't, I don't understand. What, what seems strange to me is that Mrs. Vanderbilt, the, the, his, his daughter-in-law, in her social circle on a, on a normal day, a summer day that she's in the breakers would change clothes seven times. It's interesting whether or not she ever knew how to tie her own shoelaces because she would stick out her foot just like the women of her class and a servant would put her shoe on. The next slide is maybe my favorite slide in this program because when I found it, I said, my God, that was wonderful. What you're looking at is the Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachian Mountains are something like a half a billion years old. They were once the tallest mountain range in the world. I mean, today's Rocky Mountains are lower than the Appalachians were. The Alps are lower than the Appalachians were. This mountain range made it really, really hard to get from the East Coast to the middle of the country. And in 1803, a guy named Jesse Hawley said, why do you want to get to the middle of the country? Well, maybe because everything is there. Well, how are we gonna do that? Why don't you dig a canal above the mountain range? Not across it, but where the mountain range had a bro break, the Mohawk Valley. And Mr. Hawley wrote to the governor of New York from debtor's prison. And he wrote a series of letters to say, hey, this is a great idea. And the great idea became the Erie Canal. And the Erie Canal, the route that, you, that the boats took as they went up the Hudson River and they made a left-hand turn all the way to Lake Erie because Lake Erie is up on high. And it was at the, at the time, considered to be a stupid thing. It was called Clinton's Folly because who would dig a you know, multi-hundred mile long ditch and fill it with water? But the Erie Canal literally transformed America. Something like 53% of all freight that was shipped in the United States wound up going over the Erie Canal and if you look at New York State, all of the cities that, that were important were along the Erie Canal. And people eventually recognized that there was a new technology, it was called a railroad. And this particular train, if I remember, was the fastest land vehicle in the world back in, I don't know, 1912, I seem to, and I'm making up that date, so please, I might have just lied to you, 
but it went 112 miles per hour going from New York north to, oh, I don't remember where it went, sad. And the idea of going above the mountains, okay, eventually in 1847, when, when railroads were, were growing rapidly, someone said, well, why don't we go below the mountains? And they put the city of Atlanta right there. And city of Atlanta has milepost number one, milepost number zero, to start the railroad west. And that's why Atlanta became such a big deal. And while railroads were becoming more and more popular, remember Cornelius Vanderbilt was the Commodore. He had ships and he began dabbling in railroads, but his ships clearly had to go from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And his engineer said, why not go to Nicaragua and put a mule train together and your ships will unload in the Atlantic and mules will get you across to the Pacific and you unload. And he said, that's a great idea. So he had a company in Nicaragua to you know, handle freight. And a little bit later, they came up with the idea of putting a canal across Nicaragua. And this is the route of the canal. Basically, what's interesting about it is there's a ginormous lake right in the middle of Nicaragua. And they came very close to building a canal there. A minor technical problem called the revolution stopped it. And after the revolution was put down, they had moved on. But a strange historical thing, even though the Panama Canal was built and is enormously successful, and they just giantly expanded it. One of the things that it's competing with is that the Chinese and Russians were not long ago talking about building their own canal across Nicaragua. And this is an odd thing, and then I'm going to move on. But to give you an idea of of how important canals were and then how important railroads became. Uh, in 1880, when they were still thinking about building the Panama Canal, when the French were trying to build it and having a nightmare doing so, an American engineer named James Eads, who was one of the great self-taught engineers said, why on earth would you build a canal across the uh, continent down there. Why don't you simply take the entire ship, take it out of the water, put it in a cradle, and have multiple railroads pull the ship across Mexico? And the fact that it's 125 miles long says it's relatively flat. It's relatively a desert in Mexico where this spot was. It's called Tehu. Tehu if anybody can pronounce it better than I can, please do so. Tehuantepec, and it's a desert. And unfortunately, Mr. Eads died. And while the US Congress was considering the idea and the Congress decided they were not interested in uh, pursuing this. And if any of you want to do a little investigation, you can actually go to Scientific American because there was a boatload of drawings. This is just one of them. The guy was an engineer and engineers draw pictures and say, this is how it's going to work. Brilliant man. Vanderbilt, who had begun dabbling in railroads by, the, by 1864, had sold his last ship and he was 100% invested in railroads. And this is his private Real, an engine named after him that would pull his private car. And one of the things that he did is he took control of the New York and Harlem Railroad, which was failing. But Vanderbilt said that this was a really, really interesting railroad to own because it was the only steam railroad into, New, into Manhattan. And what you're seeing here is a 1870 picture. Basically, that's the East River behind the train and the depression in the ground where the, where the, where the bridge is. 
that's the what they call the Harlem Flatlands. So Harlem was there for a very specific reason, and they built a railroad there. And there's no city, you'll notice. There's no Manhattan there, just an island. Vanderbilt lost his son. Vanderbilt is getting old and losing his son, George Washington in the Civil War is a tragedy. Apparently, his youngest son was very much like the father in that he had a boatload of energy and he was supposed to take over the family empire. Am I going too fast? Is this okay when I'm, the way I'm speaking? No one is saying that they hate it, so I'm going to continue. You're good, Mike. Okay. It is now 1866, and Cornelius Vanderbilt is 72 years old. He doesn't have an heir anymore. His presumptive heir, now that his son, George Washington, is, is passed, his presumptive, presumptive heir has had a nervous breakdown. It's not clear what is going to happen with, with William. And uh, George, uh, Cornelius is possibly an alcoholic by now, but he's certainly not a young man. I mean, in this era, he would be 30 years older than the typical mortality, okay? And even though he's 30 years older, his, uh, his, when his competitors decided to come after him because they recognized that he was an old man and he wasn't well and, and they're going to take over his empire. So he thought about it and said, you know, I have one interesting asset among the various that I have. I own the Albany Railroad Bridge. Station there. And the Albany Railroad Bridge is the only bridge that crosses the Hudson River that carries trains. And all of his competitors use this bridge to get across. And so Cornelius said, let's see, they're trying to take over. They're trying to get rid of me. They're trying to force me out. They're trying to destroy me. I am going to close the bridge to all of my competitors. And that's what he did. He said, I will be a nice person. And if you have passengers, I will let your passengers get off the train on the western side of the Hudson River. I will let them walk across my bridge and I will let them get on another train on the other side. Aren't I a nice guy? And, and uh, uh, minor, uh, the, what you see is, is the bridge lifting up. That's called the lift bridge. Uh, technically, he didn't have to do it. He simply could say, it's my bridge. And if you go over it, uh, that you're breaking the law because it's mine and I'm not letting you. The bridge itself was a swing bridge, meaning that it pivoted. And I could not get any picture of the Albany Bridge from then. But this is what a swing bridge does. And you can understand that it is closed. And no railroad is going across that swing bridge when it is closed. So all of his competitors are now, <clears throat> I'm an engineer, so I'm allowed to say this, screwed. Okay? They can't get freight to New York. And all of their stock prices crash. Because who wants to be invested in a railroad that delivers freight from the Midwest, upstate New York, to New York when you can't get to New York, which was the big market? And Cornelius buys all those railroads for pennies on the dollar. And he forms the New York Central. Now, technically, there was a New York Central as one of his competitors, but after he bought them all, he reassembled it into what we consider to be the new New York Central Railroad, which doesn't exist anymore, sadly. But, and the New York Central, some of the things he owned, 
he owned a now owned a freight yard and it's in Tribeca or it was in Tribeca and this is the the building where they put the freight when it came off the the the, the train it went into a building to store it uh, it's hard to see but the top of the building is a bronze depiction of Cornelius's life and up there Right there, what you see is the statue I showed you before. So in 1869, on the freight house in Tribeca, there was a 150-foot-long bronze bus relief, B-A-S relief. Whoever can pronounce relief better than I can. And... That statue is the one that I showed you before that is standing exactly in the front of Grand Central Terminal, the modern Grand Central Terminal. The New York Times, by the way, hated Cornelius. They hated this particular sculpture. They hated this particular depiction of his life. They wrote that, they wrote that let me get the exact words. The New York Times said the dismembered bodies of all the men, women, and children his trains had killed should have been included in the depiction of his life story. Isn't that a nice thing to say? Another one of the things he owned on 26th Street and, Par and, and, and 4th Avenue before before uh, Park Avenue was, was named, it was 4th Avenue. And this is where Madison and 4th comes together. There used to be a train depot and he wound up owning it. This is some, a drawing of it in 1857. The reason there was a train depot on 26th Street is that there was a law that said, you are not allowed to take a steam powered train downtown Manhattan where there were people. And so the train would stop, the cars would be coupled, decoupled, and horses would pull the train cars to Wall Street, for example. This particular uh, site later on was, would be used, would be reused uh, and become Madison Square Garden. And this is the original location of Madison Square Garden. And it was a train yard first. So I'm describing a law that says trains can only go to 26th Street because after that, the city starts getting crowded. Well, New York City continues growing, particularly in the you know, 1860s, 1870s. So trains, are no longer going to be allowed to go to 26th Street. Trains have to now stop at 42nd Street. So Cornelius says, okay, I own multiple railroads. I own the New York and Harlem, the New Haven Railroad, the New York Central, and they all, you know, while I'm still assembling them into New York, but there are multiple lines coming in and they all go into this structure and when you talk about Grand Central Terminal, where Grand Central Terminal is today, there were three great buildings. And I call this a great building. And if you see the three towers in front, basically that represents each of the three major rail lines that went in. So when you looked at it, you, would, you could tell your friend, go to the right, go to the left, go to the central one. And people knew where to go. And each of them had their own waiting rooms. They would later on decide that that building was too small and they made it bigger. And I literally had gone back and forth between these pictures several times before it occurred to me this particular picture is of a three-story building. This particular building is six stories. And this is 
The first one is called the Grand Central Depot. And the second one is Grand Central Station. And this was built in 1899. Now you see both of these buildings are L-shaped buildings. Behind them was this, the train yard. And inside the train yard was a train shed where the building is an L. That's the building at the end of the train yard. Trains could go in. And this was the world's largest enclosed space. And so you would take your train here, you would get off, you would walk, walk forward, and you would walk into the station. When they built it, they raised the trace train platforms. This was the first station in the world that had raised train platforms, a, a marvel of technology. Behind this is the train yard, okay? from the back of the of the enclosed space of that of that of that crystal palace okay this gives you an idea of what the train yard looks like as you're looking towards 42nd street now all of these trains 500 trains a day are going to go north they are all going to pass on 4th avenue and 4th avenue was nicknamed death alley because it was not unusual to have five, six people die a day, a week, a month. Uh, on a regular basis, people would die. Uh, there was a, uh, on, on, on this route, there was actually a tunnel as you go north and a train going into the tunnel, a steam train going into the tunnel could not see that there was another train in front of it because there was too much smoke in the train and it crashed into it and killed 15 people in 1902. And the combination of this major accident and the, the idea that 4th Avenue is Death Alley said, we have to do something significant. Another part of that picture is that the 1899 building, Grand Central Terminal, the second one, Grand Central Station it's called, was no longer capable of handling the number of people and the number of trains coming through. So for 10 years, 1903 to 1913, they put all the tracks underground. They put the entire train yard underground. They put the tracks under Park Avenue underground. They ripped down the Grand Central, I lose track, they ripped down Grand Central Station and built Grand Central Terminal. And the underground route starts at 97th Street. And one of the things they did is they electrified. So trains, going into the tunnel are no longer steam trains. They're electrically pulled. They are switched in Croton Harmon, which is 33 miles away. Could be Harmon Croton. 33 miles away, steam engines are taken off. Electric engines are coupled to the train and they go in. The, what you see here is what is called the balloon loop. And this is a, a map of all of the train tracks that I showed you earlier that sit underneath Park Avenue today, that sit underneath Grand Central Terminal. Um, I'm sorry, I just lied to you. I do apologize. This is not all of the tracks. There we go. <laughs> In order to get all the trackage that they needed, they literally built two floors of tracks. So underneath Park Avenue, you not only find a train yard, but you find a train yard under the train yard. So the bottom train yard is 42 feet down. The train yard above it is 22 feet down and all the buildings are on top of it. And one of the interesting things that you see here is you notice that there's an outside loop and I would point there, oh, wait, wait, I can point to it. I can, let's see if I can do that. 
I cannot point to it. I used to know how to point to it. Right there. Am I drawing a line there? No, too bad. I, with my laser pointer, I would trace the lines on the outside. Long distance trains, like from Chicago, from San Francisco, could literally go into Grand Central Terminal, keep going forward, and just keep going forward, and they're out of Grand Central Terminal. Commuter trains ended, and this is why it's Grand Central Terminal. It's not a station, it's a terminal. Grand Central is the end of the line. And Grand Central has 46 platforms, and it also has a secret platform. It has platform 61, which is secret. It literally was a secret platform. And 46 platforms made it really big, as in the largest train station in the world. And it still may be one of the largest, if not the largest in terms of the number of platforms. And when I talked about that there are two levels of, of a rail yard, altogether, Grand Central Terminal has 70 acres of rail yards. And here are more pictures, 33 miles of tracks. I mean, this is a big puppy. And the reason they did all that is that the real estate that used to be that ugly, smelly, steamy rail yard is now Park Avenue. Grand Central Terminal was built with an eye on the future. People of vision thought about it. They said, what is it going to be like 50 years from now, 100 years from now? And if you're going to think about the future, you bring in architects. You try to design for the future. And they brought in McKin, Mead, and White. And this is what they drew as Grand Central Terminal. And then they brought in Reed and Stern. And Reed and Stern said, no, this is what you want to build. And the picture that fascinates me is coming in from the north along Park Avenue. This is what they said you would have seen. And this represents almost what, they, what was built. Later on, they said, well, what about building a spectacular terminal building itself, not just a skyscraper, big, square, and ugly? And over time, the design of that evolved. And by the time they got around to building it, this is the design they built. And they actually planned for the sunshine coming in. And Again, I would show my laser pointer on the right-hand column, right underneath the sunshine coming in was the grand ballroom. And the grand ballroom was ginormous. And they actually made reality as they drew it. This is the sunshine coming into the main concourse. And I love this picture. Now, I want to talk to you about Grand Central Terminal, the building. It's taking me 30 minutes to get to here. And hopefully you have thought it was interesting. And I'm not allowed to give you a test to find out how much is stuck. But remember, I showed you Grand Central Terminal. And I said there was an invisible statue. And I showed you the invisible statue. Right? I showed you the invisible statue. It's right there. Can you see it? And you lose the ability to understand how big it is. Because remember, that's almost 17 feet tall because the building is so monumental. And there's another odd thing that almost nobody knows about. Right there is something from Grand Central Depot. There used to be 11 or 12 four thousand pound 13 foot diameter wrought iron equal uh, eagles only two of them are now in grand central terminal the 11 others maybe 11 they're not exactly sure are scattered in various places they know where most of them are but not all of them 
But for a hundred years in New York, if someone told you to meet me under the clock, they knew exactly where to go. And it was not the glory of commerce sculpture, which was the world's largest sculpture. Sculpture. You're looking at Hercules, Mercury, Mercury and Minerva. Uh, it is not that sculpture, even though this sculpture has a clock. And there's the clock. It's the world's largest Tiffany clock. It's 14 feet across. When they say meet me under the clock, they mean this clock, the clock that sits on top of the information booth in the main concourse. And I am told that this clock has been estimated at being worth $20 million. And I don't understand that. On the other hand, they just somebody just sold a piece of virtual art. It's somebody drew something in their computer and they said, I'll send you the file and give me $46 million for a piece of virtual art. So I don't understand that either. But the thing that you, you will never see, almost never, is that the concourse where you see the clock, Dead Square Center, has no people in it. This is what the concourse looked like when there was 26 inches of snow outside. <laughs> concourse was a big deal. Grand Central was a big deal. During World War II, something like almost half of the people, half the population of the United States passed through Grand Central Terminal. So in World War II, it was a special branch of the USO because if you were a soldier, a sailor, a Marine, the odds are that you pass through Grand Central. I know my father did. Grand Central is unusual in that they thought about how to move people with their luggage through. And if you're gonna go downstairs, there are no staircases. What you did is you went down a ramp. In fact, everywhere within Grand Central is available to you that you have to go when you're traveling using a ramp. Um, in the Again, I would point you see the line that goes across as sort of a ramp connecting the left to the right with a chandelier above. If you were traveling long distance and you were rich, you would walk across that bridge. If you were a peasant like me and you were just a, a working stiff and you had to go on a commuter train, you went to the lower level. So this is almost physical that they separated the upstairs from the downstairs, the hoity-toity from the working class. And you, if you are a downstairs and you're looking up that ramp, I have gone up and down that ramp a thousand times. And th there, is a, there is a secret there. And I don't know whether or not the secret is something that they designed or was it an accident. But if you stand in the corner and whisper at the wall, you can be heard crystal clear on the opposite corner. And you see that there are people standing in either corner whispering. And the, the ceiling is made of something called the Gustavina tile in an arch. And this is, it's almost miraculous. If you visit New York and you bring someone, you tell them to stand there and whisper and they will say thank you because they will never forget that. Behind them, behind the people right there is something called the Oyster Bar. The Oyster Bar is literally original with Grand Central. It is like the first thing that they ever did. Restaurant, it is still there. I've eaten there 20, 30 times in my life. And it's, it's, it's a New York, it's a staple of New York to visit. So I visit, I'm going to take a tour with two of my 13 or 14 children. We have had exchange students for a lot of years, and this is two of them. I take them on a tour, and, and, and it turns out these two are gluten intolerant, but, but my Teresa found there's a gluten-free pizzeria in Grand Central in an area I'd never been to. And so we, we come out, and I'm trying to, okay, where am I going to go? I know what I want to show them next. 
And a guy says, may I help you? And he's incredibly polite, but he's like, he's, yeah, he's got a tie, but it's not like a thousand dollar suit. And, he's, and this is a picture of him looking, you know, shaven. And that day he was wearing almost an old shirt and uh, it wasn't really clean shaven. And I'm like, dear God, here I have someone homeless that I have to deal with. But he was unbelievably polite. So I told him what I wanted to show the girls. And he said he'd never heard that story, even though he'd been in Grand Central for 40 years, but he knew where to take me. And it was only, I don't know, 50 feet away. He took me to where the world's most famous train used to land. This is called the 20th Century Limited. And it went back and forth to Chicago every day. And if you were anybody, you traveled on the 20th Century Limited. And the 20th Century Limited actually looks like the artist rendition. This is not Manhattan, obviously, because it has to be underground. This is actually Chicago. And they updated 20th Century Limited and they made it even more futuristic. But you could see it's a steam engine leaving Chicago, heading towards Grand Central, setting all sorts of speed records on the way. This was a big deal. When you got off, you stepped onto a red carpet because you were clearly one of the people. And you entered the Biltmore Room. The Biltmore Room was called the Kissing Room because you got off and you were hugged and kissed in the Biltmore Room. And there was a guy who sold candy and cigarettes to the passengers. They would leave, people would leave in the morning, a train would come back at night, and all day long, this gentleman walked back and forth along the back wall. And if you look at the marble floor from wall to wall along the back wall, you can actually see a slight depression because he sold candy and cigarettes to the passengers of the 20th Century Limited for 50 years. And the station remembers him in stone. And I think that's a wonderful story. And the, the gentleman who took us here, because I wasn't quite sure the, quite, the shortest route there, said, hold on a second. I want to take you some places. I want to talk to you a little bit more. And the girls were, dear God, were tracked. Mike and Joyce talking. But I said, he was polite. We have to wait two minutes. He said, he's going to wait two minutes. And he came back and he said he wanted to take me some places where civilians were not allowed. And my attitude was really very simple. Dear God, I am not going into the train tunnels with a homeless guy. And he saw my face and realized that he hadn't introduced himself. And he opened his wallet and he took out his card and his name was Mr. Harry Kelly. And he was the station master of Grand Central and his ring of keys had could open up anything. And he took us up and down the secret staircase and the secret staircase is inside the information booth. It links the lower level and the top level. He took us to see the tennis courts. I mentioned before that there were, uh, was a grand ballroom. Well, today there are two tennis courts. Back in the day, there was enough room for six tennis courts. The grand ballroom was 240 by 60 with a 40 foot high ceiling. After they closed the, uh, the grand ballroom, one of the things that they built was a television studio there. CBS recognized that that they had all of this great space and Grand Central Terminal is physically next to the Chrysler building. And all they had to do was drop a coaxial cable from the Grand Ballroom, which is now a studio, studios 41 through 44. And you're looking at a presidential election. They drop a coaxial cable, go underneath Lexington Avenue, go up the elevator shaft of the Chrysler building 
and they have a wonderful si signal to get the broadcast and uh, because they could not use the Empire State Building because NBC had that locked up and NBC and CBS hated each other. Now, let me, let me take a really quick detour, uh, really quick, three slides. I'm gonna take you to Atlantic City. I don't know if you've ever seen the boardwalk. The boardwalk there was built uh, 1929, Great Depression. And if you go inside it, it's really impressive. And the stage way back there has an organ. It is the world's largest pipe organ. And I went there because I saw a sign on the boardwalk that said, see the world's largest organ. And I was curious and I learned the story. If you have an organ, you basically have a symphony orchestra played by one man and a giant public space would have a pipe organ because you have music then, you have a, a symphony orchestra. They actually had a separate pipe organ for their grand ballroom, which was significantly smaller than Grand Central. And I've always thought that they had a giant organ for the, for the ballroom of Grand Central. No one knows, all they know is that Mary Lou Reed played a small organ, relatively small, in the concourse, and she played from 1928 through 1959. And Mary Lou Reed was forbidden by law, I believe it's by law, to play one tune. And if you were in front of me, I would ask you, does anyone, can you imagine what the one song she is not allowed to play? And I'll give you a hint. The national anthem. She was not allowed to play the Star Spangled Banner because after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, she thought she would boost morale and she played the Star Spangled Banner and everyone walking across the main concourse froze at attention until she was done. And how many of them missed their trains? So <laughs> they never let her play the Star Spangled Banner again. And in, in Grand Central, there was a school of art because they had everything there. They had a theater there. Uh, and the theater is now a wine shop. But if you go in there and you know where to look and you see the ceiling, you could see the original uh, ceiling and say, my God, it was beautiful back in the day. And as you walk around Grand Central Terminal, everywhere you see acorns everywhere. Acorns become oak trees. Oak trees are strong and oak trees last a long, long time. And the Vanderbilt family motto became out of oak trees, mighty things grow. You will see as you wander around Grand Central Terminal, light bulbs. And there are 4,000 light bulbs. I don't know if that, that's an exact number. If any of you would like to go there and actually count the light bulbs, you can report back to me. But, and they are now converted. But back in the day, they were just screwed in incandescent light bulbs. And the question is, why are they on display? And the answer is, when they opened in 1913, it was a really, really big deal to have electricity <laughs> and they were proud of it. The electricity that they had, one of the things that they had underneath was another secret room. The de at the time, the, de the deepest basement in New York City was underneath Grand Central Terminal, and it had a series of generators, converters, and this is the heart of the electrical power. And during World War II, a armed guard was placed on the staircase leading to this basement because all you would have had to have done is throw a handful of sand into each of these and Grand Central would have gone dark. And there were actually a number of German spies who were captured 
trying to do that exact thing because remember, 40% of the US population was passing through Grand Central. Grand Central also has a house. Well, that's not quite true. It has an apartment and Mr. Campbell lived there. The windows on the left are, uh, can I do this? No, I can't. Why can't I do that? I don't know. I was trying to do something. There are the windows and the, that's Grand Central Main Concourse on the other side of the window. It has, it is now a bar. Uh, uh, for a while, these were office buildings. Before that, they actually had made it into a jail. Could you imagine making this into a jail? But they did. And, hmm, you remember I mentioned that there is a secret track underneath the Waldorf Astoria. Now, the Waldorf Astoria stands where the original generation sta a station for Grand Central was. But when they switched to, um, to Con Ed, they no longer had to make their own power. They had to convert it still. The, the, uh, the secret basement was still needed but they built the Waldorf Astoria where the power plant was. And underneath the Waldorf Astoria is track number 61. And this train car is President Roosevelt's private car. And it remains there. And there is a legend that you can see a dog and President Roosevelt's dog was called Fala. And so the, the, the rumor is that this area of Grand Central is haunted by Fala's ghost. I've never seen it. Now, you remember I said that Grand Central was built for the future and that architects thought about it. They thought about more than simply Grand Central itself. They built around Grand Central Terminal what was called Terminal City, the hotels, office buildings, all sorts of stuff. And one of the things, obviously a train shows up, people have luggage and they might not need it instantly. So you build a baggage building. Behind Grand Central Terminal, they built a baggage building. And remember I said that they built on the left and right side of Park Avenue, those buildings, you can get a, a sense of what it looked like because they built all these things to the same height of Grand Central so that everything was unified. Later on, they're going to, as, as the railroads fell into decline and people weren't traveling with their luggage anymore, you take a, a plane if you wanna go long distance, they ripped down the baggage building and in its place, they built the Pan Am building, which is today the MetLife building. And you will notice that the, that the MetLife building sides are sort of indented. They did that because the architect said, if we make it square, rectangular, people will hate it more than they're gonna hate it for building it there. And so it seems just a little bit smaller, but tenants wound up getting these giant floors for their offices. But, and on top of it, it's flat because it was used as a helicopter uh, a landing strip up there until they had an accident. And on the other side is the Helmsley building, which used to be the New York Central building. This was the headquarters of the New York Central. And if you look at the base of the building, the building says, look at me, I am a railroad building, because you basically see three train tunnels where the building is built to look like three train tunnels. And this is what it looked like back in the day from the front, looking down Park Avenue, there is Grand Central, the baggage building is behind it and headquarters is behind that. And it must've been magnificent. I never saw it. I only knew the Pan Am building. And around Grand Central Terminal, we have various hotels, the Biltmore. 
a thousand rooms. The Biltmore is attached to the kissing room. You can physically go from the kissing room into the Biltmore, into its parking lots, into the hotel itself underground because this was where you wanted to go. The Roosevelt Hotel is, again, you can go by tunnel from the Roosevelt into Grand Central. Uh, I don't think, I don't know if they allow you to do that anymore. I had walked that path many times over the years, but eventually it became a refuge for the homeless. But the Roosevelt Hotel, 1,025 rooms uh, is remembered. I mean, it's still there, but uh, Guy, Lombardo, uh, Guy Lombardo and Lawrence Welk come from <laughs> the Roosevelt Hotel. Next door, was the hotel, is the Hotel Commodore. It's not the Hotel Commodore anymore. They've named it to, to something else. I don't remember what it's named to. It has 2,000 rooms. They have stripped it to structural steel and rebuilt it. But back in the day, it was considered to have had the world's most beautiful lobby. And I could not find a picture of it. Directly across the street, is the Lincoln Building. I've been in there many times. And in fact, on the, on the ground floor of the Lincoln build, Building is the original model that the sculptor crafted for the Lincoln Memorial. And I think that's wonderful. Now, you, you have a sense of Commodore Vanderbilt. You have a sense of the railroads. You have a sense of the canals leading up to that. You have a sense of, of Grand Central Terminal itself, and, and you also understand Terminal City. So I pause now, it's almost exactly eight, uh, eight o'clock. I have about 15 minutes, which you consider to the rest of the story, if that's okay. And if people wanna leave, I can talk to myself. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's fascinating. Please keep going, Mike. The rest of the story. I am now going to go cross town to a small building. It's only half the size of Grand Central. It is called Penn Station. Station because you pull into it and you can continue going across Manhattan onto Long Island. So it's only a station. It was opened three years before Grand Central Terminal. And I was never in it. When I see the pictures of it, it is literally breathtaking. To say magnificent is an understatement in my view. That's 7th Avenue. I walked up and down 7th Avenue a million times, but after it was gone. Picture, when I say gone, picture street level on up. Anything that you see that is street level on up, they erased, okay? So here is what it would have been like to be inside there. And they are going to erase from the floor on up, okay? But you look at that and say, that's gorgeous. You look at the, the main space. It was inspired by a Roman bath and they, they wrote about it. One entered the city like a god. And I thought they were talking only about this space. And I'm gonna show you something in a second. I will point out, I've already said that they're gonna knock down Penn Station, the railroads are suffering. The, they looked at Penn Station and said, if we erase the top of the building from where the people are standing on up, if we erase that, we can sell that space and put office buildings there. So what they did was they said, you know that magnificent space I just showed you? We're gonna destroy it, we're gonna rip it down. And this is vandalism at the worst. And we are just going to erase and erase and erase anything from ground level on up. The station itself is down below. Give you a sense, there is 7th Avenue, Looking at the Penn Station, 32nd Street. I've only walked down 32nd Street a thousand times. I worked, I worked uh, in two Penn Plaza, which is 
between uh, 33rd Street. And this is what it looks like now. If you had stopped back in the day, 1910, and gotten out of to uh, uh, gotten out of onto platform number six, this is what you would have seen. You would have been able to look up. The photograph on your right is from the identical spot, but remember I said they erased everything above, so they put a floor in. So now it's dark like rats, and so now it's. The full quote is, you entered the city like a god, you now scuttle in like a rat. And having been down there many times, I actually appreciate that and I never really understood how magnificent pulling into track six would have been looking up to the wrought iron expanse. And this is the identical spot. You can actually match up the pillars and see which pillars were original and the fat one they added, okay? Because there's an office building up there. Grand, uh, Madison Square Garden is up there now, all right? If you can erase something as beautiful as Penn Station, why not erase Grand Central? After all, the tracks are 42 feet down, 22 feet down, you put a roof in, you erase everything else, and life is good. And this lady, to her credit, stood up. And that is Mrs. Kennedy. And Mrs. Kennedy led the fight to save Grand Central Terminal. And we owe her a great deal. We actually owe the Supreme Court of the United States a great deal because the railroad went and said, no, we own the building. We're allowed to knock it down. We don't care that it's beautiful and that everybody's been there. We want to knock it down and we want to put something big on top of it, like the original pictures I showed you. And uh, Miss, Mrs. Huxtable said, we will be judged not by the monuments we erect, by those we choose to tear down. And that's absolutely true. And after they decided to save it, they thought it might be interesting to renovate it. The windows I'm looking that I'm showing you right now on the concourse had been painted black during World War II because they were trying to hide everything. There were blackouts. And after World War II, since they were running out of money, they didn't take off the black paint. Those are not windows. You're looking at corridors. I have walked through there from left to right or from right to left. It's a staircase on both sides. And the vision was that you would be in the concourse and these windows are on both sides of the Grand Concourse and you would see people walking back and forth. And so there's actually a corridor. Those windows are double thick with a glass floor in between them and they're about eight feet apart. So you can walk through those windows and they cleaned them and it was wonderful. They actually looked at the ceiling and they said, you know, we really should clean the ceiling because the ceiling is magnificent. And they took off half an inch of grime. Now, something I have just learned recently is that the ceiling you're looking at is actually not the original. The original ceiling looked sort of like this, okay? It was painted with the stars as they looked on the day that Cornelius Vanderbilt was born. However, there, was, there were leaks and there was mold and there was pollution. And in the 1940s, the ceiling was considered to be not salvageable. And so they put up four by eight concrete and asbestos planks and covered the entire ceiling and painted it. And they painted it as it had been. And one of the odd things about it is that when they painted it originally, some of the constellations were put on as if God is looking down on earth. Other of the constellations are on the ceiling as if you're looking at them upwards. So they're backwards. And one of the, the legends is that the 
architect, the, the, the guy who painted it, didn't tell the guy, the workman, when you look at the ceiling, you hold my drawings up. You don't put it on the floor because if you do, it's backwards. But the 1913 ceiling is not there. The 1913 ceiling actually had a number of lights to show you the bright stars. The replacement didn't have it. All the stars were, 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 were extinguished, okay? When they renovated in the 90s, 80s, 90s. And I remember these people working on a bridge bent over backwards, cleaning the, the ceiling. When they renovated, they put most of the lights back. They didn't clean the whole ceiling. If you look above Michael Jordan's restaurant, and I don't know if that's still there anymore, but you see the rectangle? That is the uncleaned ceiling from 1942. And if you look at the, at the ceiling here, you see the lines, the very faint lines? Each one of them is an asbestos and cement tile, but because of the asbestosness of it, they said you can't take it down. Let's just paint it over and leave it up there and it will be safe. An odd thing in the ceiling, an odd thing in the ceiling is that there is a five inch hole in the ceiling. When they renovated, they said, we have a hole in the ceiling. Said, well, you know, Grand Central has been important and this is a part of our history. When the Russians launched Sputnik, there was an interesting question of whether or not Americans were losing the space race. And they said, we are going to boost Americans' morale by putting a redstone rocket into Grand Central Terminal, into the main concourse, but you don't want to have this puppy fall over. That would be a bad thing. And so there's actually a cable that goes from its point, from its nose to the ceiling. And so that, that hole in the ceiling has been left to remember when this was used to boost morale. The waiting room of Grand Central Terminal is unusual because Grand Central no longer has a waiting room. Grand Central's waiting room became, if you were homeless, that's where you slept. If you look at the floor of this room, you can actually see depressions in front of each of the seats. And the depressions were from the almost 100 years of people sitting and shuffling their feet. So the room remembers that it was used for waiting. And nowadays they have events. Uh, here is an event. They're playing squash in Vanderbilt Hall. Vanderbilt, okay? And I've been there to see various exhibitions there. They've, they've, they've made Grand Central now into a money-making thing. They've made it into a mall. And so it has a giant food market, which is actually wonderful to wander through. And the downstairs has a, has a food court uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the lower, in the lower level uh, underneath the concourse. One of the weird things that they have done now after um, almost a hundred years is they've said, you know, it would be good if we could, could connect Grand Central to Penn Station. And so now if you go down 14 stories down, 140 feet down in the bedrock of Manhattan, they have carved a little hole, okay? And when, you say, when I say little hole, eventually this, is, this has been split in half horizontally. At the end, you see the, the circles? Each of those is a train tunnel. So there are four train tunnels that go into this space and it's going to continue on the other side. And they have, this is called the East Side Access Project. And this is half of it. They're still working on it. 
They originally thought they were going to spend $3 billion. When I have last looked at this, I've heard that the number that they've spent is close or they're estimating is going to be something like $12 billion. So uh, it's incredible how much the infrastructure of New York is being expanded by this little thing. And that brings my talk to an end. If you uh, haven't gone there, you can take a train there, eventually from New Jersey, from Long Island, certainly, eventually when they complete the link, from Northern New York, always. Amtrak used to go there. They've moved Amtrak to Penn Station. Amtrak went there for 80 years. There are actually tour guides who can take you through and you can physically see, and then you can figure out, do I know more than these tour guides? Or you can ask yourself, what did I lie to you about? Okay, and doing research, there's an incredible amount of information out there. I have a YouTube channel I, I mentioned to you, it's called Be More Better. It's what I do in retirement. I try telling you something interesting. And in every case, I try to give you something that is potentially life-changing. Hopefully here, it's not so much the facts. It's the idea that Mr. Vanderbilt had an 11th grade education and look what he did. Look at what Mr. Eads was able to conceive of with our education, why, why can't we do more? I have three videos only on Grand Central, my 74th, 75th, and 76th, and I have a number of them on railroads uh, here. And I will leave the talking if there are any questions.